A little while back, we took our kids to a zoo, <clears throat> which is always a fun experience. Uh, all the animals, it was really cool to see God's creation. Um, but one of the highlights of the zoo, every time we've taken our kids, is the monkey exhibit, because uh, you just never know what you're going to get there. Um, those monkeys are wild. Uh, there's a reason that we often call our kids monkeys. Um, they just swing off of anything. They will do all kinds of inappropriate things, and it's just awesome. Um, but at the zoo that we were at, uh, the monkey exhibit is actually like in the center of a couple air, like observation decks, if you will. And so you can watch from different angles, and they're climbing all over stuff, swinging on ropes and everything, doing other things we won't say. And um, as we're watching, um, I'm watching the monkeys, and I realize that there's a family on the opposite side watching kind of counter to me. And this family that's watching from the other side is Amish. Like, it's just very obvious. They're Amish, the hairstyle, the clothing, everything about them. And you know, this is in COVID season, like so everybody's got masks on, but not this family. And, and they're just there, and they're having the time of their life, like laughing at the monkeys and all this stuff. And it's, it doesn't take me long before I realize that I have totally stopped watching the monkeys. And I'm just watching this Amish family. Like, I'm, I've paid to be at a zoo to watch the animals, and instead, I'm watching this family because they're just so different. And I'm watching them and thinking, like, what is the irony that here I am at this monkey exhibit watching another human? And I kind of wonder, like, are they watching me? <laughs> are they watching the monkey? Like, am I as fascinating to them as they are to me? And, and so I'm just wondering all these things. Um, but isn't it just so deeply ingrained in us to constantly be comparing ourselves to others? Like radically different. Or, ah, oh, I could do better. It's like we're just constantly comparing ourselves to others. And, and there's a healthy side of that, um, sociologically or psychologically, like you identify with and against things. And so a lot of that's how we make sense of who we are. Uh, but there's a lot of it that's unhealthy. The constant comparison of me and you. And, and the reality is that so much of the unhealthy side of that comes from the fact that like, we naturally view things from our own perspective. Like we view the world around us through an egocentric lens that I'm at the center of all this. And why not? Because I mean, it's my perspective. Or an ethnocentric perspective that, well, my people. Like we're constantly viewing others through these lenses and the reality is, again, that we tend to favor ourselves in that. Well, I'm the standard. I get to decide what is good, better, best, awful, all that stuff. Like, so I'm comparing everything to myself and my own standards, which in the, in the argument of Paul in his letter to the church in Rome, what we call Romans, he says, like, you don't even keep your own standards, let alone the standard of God. And so what is the issue, what is it in us that, that just constantly wants to compare and see where we line up? So we are in Mark, continuing our study um, this changes everything, encountering Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And so if you will turn, we're in chapter 9 today. So we jumped ahead some more. Chapter 9 of the book of Mark, and we're starting in verse 33. It says, They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them. So this is Jesus and his disciples. They've come back to Capernaum. They're in a house. He asked them, oh, What were you arguing about on the way? You hear that? <laughs> Kids are going out in the back seat. I don't know. I'm not going to deal with this right now. When we get home, <laughs> we go home. All right. What was that all about? You have nothing, nothing. Well, she, he, all that back and forth. So Jesus waits. They get in the house and he asks them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent because on the way they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. How does that feel? Jesus. <laughs> calls you out. What was that argument about? Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Well, they're all just quiet. Not really, guys. What was it about? They don't want to say anything because they're arguing about who is the greatest. Like, what an argument to have, right? Come on, guys. How childish can you be? Who's the greatest? No, I'm greater. Oh, Peter, like, oh, I'll punch you in the face, boy. Like, just, you just imagine them going back and forth like, no, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. Everybody's kind of standing up a little more. Like, I'm 5'9", I swear it. I'll show you my license. Like, no, I'm the greatest. Everybody's jockeying for position, posturing against each other. Because, you know, nobody's in that argument. It wouldn't be an argument if somebody was like, no, I'm not the greatest. That's all right. That's cool. <laughs> but it's because they all want to be the greatest that they're having this argument, and Jesus is calling them out. What do you have to say for yourselves, boys? I... I 
I, we can't read it into there, but I just so wish that, that I was there and Jesus would have said something like, oh, never mind, we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. What drives our comparing and quest for greatness or just besting others? What is it in us that just wants to be better than someone else? That wants to know that I am right and you are wrong? What is it that drives that compulsion? And, and, and it's for me too. Like I hope and I pray by God's grace that the height of my arrogance is behind me. Um, but in one such moment, when I was in college, I've shared this with many of you before, but like it haunts me still. I know that I am forgiven, but I have to remind myself constantly when I feel the shame of this moment that I am forgiven. That Jesus died saying it is finished. He paid my penalty for the arrogance in my life and my heart. But when I was in college, uh, I was in this political science class and the professor was insanely smart. And, and I just, like, I don't like to think anyone's smarter than me, even though I know, and I'll just tell you, like, I'm never the smartest person in the room, but this guy was brilliant. This guy worked for the CIA. He had been in two different White House administrations, and so you came into class, and he'd have, like, a stack of things for you to read in addition to your textbooks. And I'd be like, how many trees are you killing, man? Come on. But this guy, he knew stuff. Like, he knew things. And so we would start the class with a quiz that was based on all the extra reading, like not even in the, the textbooks assigned in the syllabus. And these quizzes would be really, really hard. And you would grade them in that moment so you knew what you got. And so I would miss things, and I would just get so mad because I, I was an awful student, and so I just did not study, and there was no way I was reading his stack of stuff, so I was just trying to figure the test out, if you know what I mean. And that just didn't work a lot of the time. But there was one day in particular that there was a question that I got wrong and I like in my mind could make sense of it. It's like, that's not okay. And so I challenged him on it and he just kind of let me have it. It's a little embarrassing. And so we won't go into all the details of that. But just now imagine, here's little Kevin kind of cowering down like, okay, I'm in my place. But I don't want to be in my place. I don't want you or the rest of this room to think that you are smarter than me. And so what do I do? I become incredibly childish. <laughs> I, I decide well, he knows something I don't know. I'm going to pretend like I know something he doesn't know. So every time the professor would look at me, I'd just kind of smirk. Like, and he'd look at me again, i just... Every, like the entire lecture, every time he'd look at me, I'd just break out in this grin and never lose eye contact with him. Just stare at him smiling, and I could see like it's having an effect on him. Like he, throughout the lecture, is getting more and more uncomfortable, and he's watching me and he's thinking, like, what does that kid know that I don't know? What is making him smile? And finally, at the end of the class, I knew that I won the day. Because he ends the lecture, closes his stuff, and just says, Mr. Franklin, is my fly on done? Is something funny? And I just I just broke out in a full-on grin. I was like, no, nothing, and left. And I felt like, yes, I got him. Got him. I'll show you who's better. But that's our thing, right? Like, it's funny to think about, but it, like, how much turmoil was that poor man in? He did nothing wrong. He was doing his job. But because of my insecurity that I could not stand the idea that this guy is way smarter than me, I, just, mm, I, got, I got to get my, uh, and it's in us. And how much do we see that in the world around us right now? Like, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, just, just stop talking about this, but, but we have to accept our reality. That things have not been overall all that great lately. And the world around us, it's been a global pandemic, all of the different turmoil in various spheres of life. Uh, a study that I read about this week says in 2019, um, so prior to the, to the pandemic beginning, in America, 11% of adults reported symptoms of anxiety disorder or depressive disorder. 11%, which is a lot. How about one out of 10 people? Like clinical issues of anxiety or depression. You know what it was last month? January 2021, it was up to 41.1%. That almost half of our nation is reporting clinical levels of anxiety and depression. Man. Has all the calamity of the last year brought out the best of us? Hardly not. And there are definitely exceptions, and I pray that our church is a shining light in darkness. And I see it, and I love it. But when we look at our culture as a whole, 
We are so full of anger, so full of violence. From every side, polarization, as I just said, every side, because we start to think in these binary terms that it's us, them, it's you're either this or you're that. It's all the tribalism, all of that. It's the I am right and you are wrong and we will fight viciously. But it's really just a quest for greatness. And don't you just love, like, in that, and, and like, I, I'm guilty in this with you, but so often, like, isn't it hurtful when you just take a step back after you hear somebody kind of lay into you, and you're like, man, I'm a human, made in the image of God. And how wrong is it to reduce all of the complexity of who we are as humans into just saying, you are this, and I am not. But what drives that? that oversimplification of like everything suddenly became political and you're like, that was not political at all. Like why do we keep reducing people down to just this thing that we push against because we're better? And it's probably at the root of what has been our problem all along. Since we fell in the garden, as Adam and Eve rebel against God, defying the creator, and they realize their shame and their nakedness, that they're not the greatest. I feel this, I feel the weight of this. And what do they do? They start sowing some fig leaves to cover their shame because we just couldn't accept the shame that we're not the greatest. And so we'll hide it. We'll hide all of our flaws. And we've continued this game since. What is all that about? I want to do this. I want to be better. It's I, 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 I. It's self-righteousness that I will be right I will make myself right. I will be greater. I will be the greatest. It's self-righteousness. We've talked about this a few weeks ago, but like self-righteousness fuels anger like nothing else. When you're bitter and angry, you're holding something that you just can't let go against someone else, it's really because you view yourself as more righteous than them. And so we step back and say, oh man, just grace. So what is it? that remedies this constant comparing, this quest for greatness or besting each other. Look at verse 35. So Jesus just asked them, called them out. Hey, what are you guys fighting about? (laughs) They're quiet because they're fighting about who's the greatest. Verse 35, sitting down, he called the 12 and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. And so the, the cultural posture of a rabbi when teaching is to take a seat. And so you just imagine they're in this house, there's the hustle and bustle, like everybody's getting in, like, whew, all right, long journey. Hey, boys, what were you fighting about back there? What was that argument all about? Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. He knows. You're arguing about who is greatest. So he takes a seat, which they all realize now, uh (laughs) uh-oh, here comes. So he's now gonna teach them something profound. And this is what he says. If anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. He must be last and servant of all. You want to be greatest? You want greatness in your life? And Jesus says, this is what it looks like. Take a back seat. Just serve everyone. You want people to respect you. You want to amass power. You want all the things that we associate with greatness. And here Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Just put yourself behind everyone else and serve them. And then you'll actually be first. That does not make sense. Like, how to win friends and influence people. Like, here's the book. Come on, man. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. And Jesus is like, no, this is what it looks like. Oh, great. You guys are arguing about who's the greatest? Continue that quest, but this is what it looks like. If you want to be there, you want to be first? Be last. Be the servant of all. And isn't that beautiful? Because that is the gospel. Jesus sitting there saying, to be first is to be last and servant of all. Because what did he come to do? He said, I, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. That Jesus came to say, left the throne of heaven, took on the form of man, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It's Philippians 2. He emptied himself humbled himself, and became the servant of all. He became last 
and the servant of all, and now what is he? He is first, and don't you dare question it. That it may be contested right now, and that's why Jesus taught us to pray, hallowed be your name. Like there's a tension. Let's see it be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the day is coming, and you can know it with certainty. The day is coming that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that he is Lord. He is first. Jesus is first because he became last and servant of all, and he's saying, follow me in this. This is what it looks like. And the bottom line is that the way to greatness or the way of greatness is just submission and service to the greatest. And that's greatest at the end with a capital G because it is God himself. He is greatest. So if we want greatness, we want to follow in the way of greatness, it's to just submit to and serve the greatest, to submit to God, to serve God, and then we will find true greatness. But it's actually not wrong to pursue greatness. But what does that pursuit look like? God is greatest. And so we have to see how he relates to us. And you know how he relates to us. That we deserve wrath and condemnation that we have defied him. We fail every day. And yet he comes in loving pursuit of us and says, I call you friends. You don't deserve to be in a right relationship with God, but by grace or undeserved favor, nothing you can do to earn a right standing with God but he comes and says, I give it freely because I love you. So it's grace. Grace is what changes everything. When we see the grace of God vertically to us, it translates into this grace we can extend horizontally to others. And now my quest for greatness is actually just, oh, I can submit and serve you. This is real greatness. I don't need that. It changes us. In the language of Paul Tripp in his book on leadership, he says, God's saving grace ignites in the heart's of all his children, a radical shift in ambition. Where once our thoughts, desires, words, and actions were motivated and directed by our ambition to achieve our definition of personal happiness, by grace, they're now shaped by our ambition for the kingdom of God, to achieve all God has designed for it to achieve. Do you see that? Grace frees us. I mean, consider grace. That there was a price to be paid for our sin. And we're living in the curse of this broken world because of our own sin. And he could leave us to this. And in fact, we deserve even worse. We deserve hell for all of eternity. Eternal suffering is what every single one of us deserves because we have all turned aside from God. We've started worshiping created things instead of the creator. We deserve hell. But the gospel or good news is that God so loves us in grace And when we don't deserve it, he came and he died for us on a cross. He took our place, our rightful place on a cross, and he was forsaken so we would never be forsaken. He died the death that we deserve. But then he rose again victorious. He came up on the third day, having conquered sin and death, and said, I have the keys of the grave and hell. He's conquered it. And now he extends that to us, saying, just believe and follow me. Turn from your sin. Confess that you are a sinner and live a life of repentance and this posture before God that says, you are the greatest, you are Lord Jesus, and I trust you to be my salvation. This is the good news. This is grace that frees us. So we're no longer stuck in the enslavement of this constant quest for greatness as the world defines it. Freedom. Freedom is found in release. It's release of control in this quest. It's submission to the reality that we are not the greatest. And the words of Dr. Timothy Keller, I love how he says this. He says, because a fish absorbs oxygen from water, not air, it is free only if it is restricted to water. If a fish is freed from the river and put out on the grass to explore, its freedom to move and soon live is destroyed. Real freedom is finding the right restrictions. Have you thought about that? Like we want to be free, But real freedom is not just to break our enslavement and our submission to everything. It's finding the right thing to submit to. And that is God himself. Submit to God. In the language of the New Testament, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that at the right time he may exalt you. It's in our humbling and submitting to God that we find true greatness. So live in light of that gospel, beloved that he frees us and we're undeserving, but we're so loved and free in Christ. 
And look at what Jesus does now. Flip the paradigm on its head to them. Okay, you want greatness? If anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. And then he does this. It says, verse 36, he took a child, had him stand among them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. He's like, let me teach you something with an illustration for a moment. As he's sitting there, and he takes this child and brings him in. And why would he do that? Why does Jesus take a child to make his point? Because a child has no standing. You see that? Child has no standing. I bring my son in here, and I'm like, everybody listen to him. (laughs) How'd that go? Not too well. You wouldn't listen to him. And understandably, I would encourage you, don't listen to him. (laughs) It'll get crazy. But why don't you listen to him? Because he's a child and he has no standing. But what does Jesus do? Jesus takes a child who has no standing and he stands him in their midst. So you guys want greatness? Look at this. Look at this child. You want greatness? Welcome the ones like this. The ones who have no standing in life. Why don't you go submit to and serve the ones who can do nothing for your personal quest of building your own kingdom? Find the one who can contribute nothing to you and serve that one, and there you will find greatness. And in doing that, what you're doing is you're actually welcoming God himself. So whoever welcomes one such as this, like this little child who has no standing here, who can do nothing for you in your personal agenda, you welcome that one and you've welcomed me. And then when we think about our life and all of our ambitions and everything that we're running after, and you think, okay, that's what it is to welcome God. How often am I welcoming God? And if I'm not welcoming God, what have I missed out on? I'll tell you, you missed out on true greatness. This is real greatness, is to be last, to be the servant of all, to see those who have no standing and say, let me just love you and serve you put myself behind you. And how do we do that? It's the gospel again, the way that God did it for us, that it was by grace. And so now we have that grace in us that God has given to us and it empowers us now to not do that for others, to just love people. Yeah. I think we're missing so much when we don't see that. I I just love in this illustration, like talking about greatness and he brings this child and think like, what is it about a child And like, doesn't it look like real greatness to look at a child playing? That they have such freedom and peace. They're not so obsessed with the way that they appear and everything. And there's there's this video that my wife pulls up on the TV on YouTube, and it's this toddler who dances. She does like this ballet performance in front of a huge auditorium, and, and she's good. Like, this little toddler is dancing, and she looks like she's borderline professional. Like, fluid motions everywhere. I will spare you of me trying to act it out. But it's, it's actually really good in moving. Set to this beautiful melody, like all this stuff. Like, it's, it's just, it's really good. And my daughter loves it. So if you know Elena, she's like, she loves dancing. We, we went on a date for Valentine's Day, and I'm asking her, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, and the consistent thing, I want to be a dancer. She wants to be a dancer. We did the free dance classes with her, and she loved it and everything. But, like, you even watch her in there, and she's, like, tackling little girls. Like, she's got a big brother who plays hockey, <laughs> and it shows. She's not the most graceful. She's going she's gonna to get in there and get things done. But she watches this toddler on the TV dancing, and she loves it, and she starts to, to mimic everything that the girl's doing, and it's hysterical to watch. Like, I love her. I don't know if she's ever going to hear this, but, man, it's like we crack up, and we're just trying not to laugh out loud so she doesn't hear us, but, like, you watch her, and she's fully convinced that she's doing everything that this girl's doing, so fluid, and it's beautiful and everything, but it's just like, oh, oh girl, <laughs> oh, maybe one day. But like, it's, it's just hilarious, and then she gets to this point where the girl does a cartwheel, and Elena tries it, and completely forgot, that, like, that's just physically not possible for her, and she almost dies, and we're like, no, no, okay, like, this was cute until now, like, you're gonna get seriously hurt, but she's just loving it, enjoying it, living life, and the freedom and peace of not being so consumed with being greater than someone else. That she could watch that girl on TV and think, I'll never be like that. 
well, I can do this better. But instead, she just, that's cool. I want to do that. And she has fun trying. It's not this battle of who's better. It's freedom. It's enjoyment. A child has the wonder and the joy that brings life to relationships. A child has the humility to actually accept correction. And so much of what we're to do, church family, is help each other, spur each other on to love and good works. That's why we gather. And that means that we're going to do really wonderful things that just give you the good feeling of like encouragement and and all that. But it also means we're going to do the hard things, like rebuke each other, call each other out, and hold each other accountable. Say, no, 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 that is not leading to life. Let's change that. But if we don't have the humility to accept that, man, Jesus is saying, no, well, you gotta be like this child. The one who has no standing, submit. Submit to God who is the greatest and then be able to submit to each other and stop the quest for greatness. Man, uh, this just, I want this so bad for you. I'm praying so desperately for us as a church to be this. Do you realize what an effective witness it is when we live in that kind of freedom? when we live with that kind of peace that we've stopped this crazy quest for greatness that is at the expense of others and instead say, I'll take a back seat. I'll be last. I'll serve everyone. This is what James talked about, this kind of peace. In James chapter four and verse one, he says, what is the source of wars and fights among you? If I've done any marriage coaching or counseling with you or you're in conflict, you've heard me say this. I use it all the time. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? What is it that creates all these fights among you? That creates all this tension? That strips you, robs you of peace and joy because you're just comparing yourself to others? What is it that creates all that turmoil? All that fighting? All that conflict? Is it not that your passions are just at war within you? that all of the external fighting and calamity is really just a manifestation of something that is wrong inside of me. That my passions are at war within me and that bleeds over into this insecurity and this just crazy dynamic where I'm in conflict and tension with everyone. But if you can be such a person of peace, of inner security in the gospel, to know that I am in right standing with God. He has adopted me as his son and nothing can take me out of his hand. The immeasurable riches of heaven are mine and him. And for all of eternity, he is never growing weary of just showing me everlasting kindness that I'll never know the end of it. And so here on this planet, circumstances can be insane and I'm okay because he is greatest and he's for me. He's proven he loves me. When you have that kind of peace within you to where you don't have to fight, you don't have to try to convince people that you're something you're not and all of that. Oh, what a witness to the world that is watching. And this is why Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he said things like, you know, when someone slaps you on the one cheek, you turn the other. All right, I'll take it. And they come to you and like, hey, carry my stuff for a mile. And you're like, I'm gonna go two miles. And they come and they're like, give me, give me your shirt. And you're like, okay, I'll give you my shirt. Here's my undershirt as well. Because I need that. Like, go above and beyond to bless your enemy. And why? Because of the insanely powerful witness of someone who is just at peace. That I don't have to be better than you. I don't have to be greater because the greatest loves me. And I just live with him. Yeah, take it. None of it's mine. It's all his. He'll provide. He loves me more than the flowers and the birds. And look at them. They're not freaking out. So find peace in God, who is the greatest. And let that be a witness to the world. And and I just want to say really quick, this does not mean that I say you need to set aside all of your reasoning and and never take a stand and fight for anything. We fight for justice and truth. We do. But if you just heard me say that in every kind of fight in your life that you can think of, you just immediately say, okay, yeah, I'm good. Then you might need to go back and look at those things. 
I have a humility to really ask God, like, was I right in that? Was I after truth or was I after just being the best? To be greater, to prove my point. Let's be like the Christians observed uh, 125 AD. The philosopher Aristides, he's writing to the emperor Hadrian and, and he's just saying like, this is, this is what I see about these Christians, these people who call themselves Christians. This is what I see and this is what he writes. This is, just follow with me. This is profound. It says, further, if one or other of them have bondmen or bondwomen or children, through love towards them, they persuade them to become Christians. And when they have done so, they call them brethren without distinction. They do not worship strange gods and they go their way in all modesty and cheerfulness. Falsehood is not found among them and they love one another. And from widows, they do not turn away their esteem and they deliver the orphan from him who treats him harshly. And he who has gives to him who has not without boasting. And when they see a stranger, they take him into their homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. For they do not call them brethren after the flesh, but brethren after the spirit and in God. And whenever one of their poor passes from the world, each of them according to his ability gives heed to him and carefully sees to his burial. And if they hear that one of their number is imprisoned or afflicted on account of the name of their Messiah, all of them anxiously minister to his necessity. And if it is possible to redeem him, they set him free. And get this, if there is among them any that is poor and needy, and if they have no spare food, they fast. Can we love like that? Can we set aside our personal agendas, our own personal kingdoms, to say we'll live for the kingdom and we'll love each other so freely that the world will look and be like, what is that? This is a people who frees everyone they can who goes out of their way at the expense of their livelihood to provide for each other. And when they don't have enough money because one of them is hungry, they don't have enough money to buy them food, they say, time for me to fast. Eat what I was gonna eat. What kind of love is this? It's the kind of love that Christ has for us. And what a powerful testimony to the world to be people of peace and love, to set aside our agendas for greatness and say, no, the true path to greatness is to just submit and serve the greatest. And that looks like serving everyone because Jesus said, here's this child with no standing. Look at him stand among you. If you welcome him, you welcome me. So let's stop viewing every decision, every interaction, every relationship through a tribal lens. Let's seek truth and understanding as the people of God. Let's act in and with grace. Let's keep a proper perspective, eyes fixed on things above, where Christ is seated. See the gospel, that Jesus has already accomplished everything we need. Jesus has given us this unshakable and unmatched identity in himself. And Jesus has shown us that the true path to greatness is actually through sacrifice and service. It's submitting to the greatest. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, we say that because you love us. You have shown us what it is to be great, Jesus, and we want to humbly come confessing that often we are after something that does not look like that. So God, would you change our hearts? We repent, and we lament the loss of what could have been accomplished for your glory in our personal quest for greatness, but we rejoice in the fact that you redeem things and you are still using us. So God, use this church powerfully. Let us be such a bright light in the darkness of this world, driving out darkness with your truth as your good news. You have come to make a way because you are gracious. We love you. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus.